What if the US had built a jet that could launch from a runway and fly straight into space? During the Cold War, while others relied on heavy fuel tanks and complex launch systems, America pursued a bold new idea, the Rockwell X-30. This is the story of the jet that could have made a spaceflight routine, but never got the chance. Some even believe it could have given the US a reusable launch advantage decades before SpaceX had it flown. Backed by NASA, the Pentagon, and President Reagan himself, it was the cutting edge of ambition, until it wasn't. Back in the 80s, the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a global competition, not just for military power, but for technological dominance. And one of the most important arenas for this rivalry? Space. NASA had already taken the lead with the Apollo missions, landing men on the moon. But that was in the past. Now America needed something new. Every launch was a big production. Parts were thrown away, safety margins were tight, rendering it a poor choice for regular use. Meanwhile, the Department of Defense was thinking about space in a different way. Not as a place to explore, but as high ground. Whoever could get there faster and more often could gain a strategic advantage. Satellites could track enemy movements, intercept communications, and maybe even be used for defense. Getting there quickly, reliably, and cheaply could mean the difference in a global conflict. Other countries that are involved in the race to develop a national aerospace plane. Japan has a major effort that's underway. The Soviet unions have a lot of capability in this area. And there are at least four countries in Europe that are actively pursuing the development of hypersonic and aerospace planes. We need to keep moving on this program if we're to maintain the leadership in aerospace vehicles. The U.S. government knew the idea for X-30 wasn't just cool, it could change everything. The National Aerospace Plane Program, or NASP, was born out of this vision. President Ronald Reagan didn't hold back. In his 1986 State of the Union address, he described NASP as the next leap forward. While Reagan's description was metaphorical, it captured the ambition behind the NASP project. It wasn't a literal space shuttle replacement, but a next generation platform to rival anything in development. A new Orient Express that will take off from Dulles Airport and accelerate up to 25 times the speed of sound, reaching low Earth orbit in minutes. He called it the future of American space travel. This wasn't just a research program. It was a bold national bet that would secure America's place as a dominant player in space travel. This nation remains fully committed to America's space program. We're going forward with our shuttle flights. We're going forward to build our space station. And we're going forward with research on a new Orient Express that could, by the end of the next decade, take off from Dulles Airport, accelerate up to 25 times the speed of sound, attaining low Earth orbit, or flying to Tokyo within two hours. Think of it this way, the space shuttle needed giant boosters, an external tank, a launch pad, and an army of support systems. On the other hand, the X-30 was designed to be a single stage to orbit SSTO aircraft that would taxi down a runway. It would take off under its own power and accelerate past Mach 25, over 19,000 miles per hour, fast enough to break out of Earth's atmosphere and enter low Earth orbit. No dropped stages, no disposable fuel tanks, no wasted components. The X-30 was meant to be reusable, durable, and if it worked, it would completely upend how we thought about reaching space. That's why the program was so ambitious. With the X-30, space could become as routine as air travel, at least in theory. The X-30 needed something no plane had ever used before, scramjet engines, short for supersonic combustion ramjets. These engines don't work at all unless you're already flying faster than Mach 5. At takeoff and lower speeds, the X-30 would use turbojets or traditional engines to get moving. But once the aircraft hit hypersonic speeds, the scramjets would ignite, compressing and burning the air at incredible speeds, allowing the aircraft to keep accelerating like a bullet, all without carrying heavy oxidizers like rockets. The idea behind this technology was deceptively simple. Don't carry your oxygen like a rocket, grab it from the atmosphere. But here's where things got complicated. No one had ever made a working scramjet fly at hypersonic speeds before. Sure, there were test models in wind tunnels, there were computer simulations, but nothing that had proven it could operate in real atmospheric flight at Mach 6, Mach 8, or higher. In fact, a scramjet wouldn't function from a standstill. It needs to be accelerated by another propulsion method first, like a rocket booster or turbojet. And that wasn't even the hardest part. Traveling that fast through Earth's atmosphere creates intense heat. 
Friction with the air at hypersonic speeds causes temperatures on the aircraft's leading edges, like the nose and the engine inlets, to skyrocket. We're talking 1,650 degrees Celsius, or 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt most metals. NASA and Rockwell's engineers were faced with a brutal challenge. The X-30 was now a mission about pioneering an entire new set of technologies. Every piece of this plane had to be invented. 1. Fuel tanks that could hold liquid hydrogen at negative 253 degrees Celsius, negative 423 degrees Fahrenheit, without leaking or cracking. The tanks had to be both ultra-light and ultra-strong, capable of handling flight stress while insulating hydrogen colder than anywhere on Earth. Any leak could be catastrophic. 2. Airframe materials that could handle violent pressure changes while staying light enough to fly. 3. Thermal shields that wouldn't shatter or burn up during re-entry like the tiles on the space shuttle. And all of this had to work together in a single seamless system. When you look at pictures of the X-30 today, it doesn't resemble a plane at all. It looks like something you'd expect to see in a sci-fi movie or strapped to the top of a rocket, sharp, long, and alien in shape. And that was entirely intentional. The body was wide and flat underneath, with sharp edges and needle-like nose. From nose to tail, the craft stretched just under 82 feet, with a slim profile and wedge-shaped underbelly, specifically designed to slice through the air at hypersonic speeds. The cockpit was sunken deep into the fuselage, reducing its exposure to the airstream and helping it survive the heat and pressure of flight. And it wasn't just what it looked like, it was how it had to survive. The X-30 didn't fail, because it was too big, too soon. The materials needed to withstand Mach 25 flight didn't exist in mass-producible form. The scramjet engines, while tested in theory and in labs, hadn't been proven in live flight at those speeds. The heat protection systems, metallic skins, specialized composites weren't ready. Cryogenic fuel tanks for liquid hydrogen couldn't yet be made light and durable enough at the required scale. And then came the price tag. What started as a $3 billion program ballooned to over $17 billion, and that was without a working prototype. Engineers had models, mock-ups, and parts, but not a single full-scale flight-ready X-30. Timelines slipped, confidence faltered. Meanwhile, the world was changing. The Cold War was ending. The Soviet threat that had helped justify such massive defense-related spending was fading, and the space shuttle, imperfect but still flying, remained the workhorse of NASA's human spaceflight program. It was safer to stick with what already existed than to wait another decade for a next-gen space plane that might never take off. So in 1994, the axe finally fell. The X-30 was officially cancelled. NASP was shut down. It failed because it was decades ahead of what technology could realistically support. More than 30 years later, the Rockwell X-30 still stands as one of the most ambitious aircraft ever built. Because everything the X-30 tried to be, the world is still trying to build today. Yes, the scramjets are back. In 2020, the US Air Force successfully tested a hypersonic missile that used scramjet technology to reach Mach 5. The single stage to orbit vehicle, we can fly directly from, uh, from our point of departure, an ordinary runway, fly straight into orbit without losing or having to throw away any parts of the airplane. And from the perspective of operating costs, simplicity, lower complexity, uh, it has a lot of advantage. China and Russia have both demonstrated hypersonic glide vehicles, traveling at speeds the X-30 once aimed for. NASA is once again studying space planes, not with the same urgency as during the Cold War, but with an eye toward routine reusable space access. SpaceX's Starship, while using a two-stage rocket design, aims for the same outcome as the X-30, a fully reusable space vehicle that drastically reduces launch costs. And in the UK, a hybrid air-breathing rocket system is being designed to power Skylon, a space plane not so different from what Rockwell envisioned. Their goal? A single stage-to-orbit vehicle using a runway for launch and landing. Sound familiar? In truth, the idea never died, because the X-30 wasn't just about speed, it was about changing our relationship with space. If the X-30 had flown, the 2000s might have looked very different. Cheaper satellites launched more often, hypersonic cargo delivery anywhere on Earth in under an hour, space tourism long before the current boom, maybe even spaceports integrated into major airports. It's not fantasy, it was the trajectory the X-30 was setting. And while we never got there in the 90s, we might be edging closer now. So what did we lose? We lost time. The X-30's cancellation wasn't a total loss. It's seeded advancements in thermal shielding, cryogenic storage, and flight modeling that influenced later hypersonic research. Today, as we once again look toward the moon, Mars, and beyond, we're dusting off old dreams with new tools. And in that dream, the X-30 still lives. 
It was a machine too advanced for its time, but not perhaps too advanced for ours. 